All right, so we have um, an exam coming up on Monday. That's May 11. I think that's Monday. Yeah. And uh, this exam covers uh, the material that I covered in the last lecture of classes. And here's an example exam that I gave before. And here's, some, here's an additional practice problem, the school bus problem. And that has answers here. And so today I want to uh, spend more time reviewing and preparing, helping you prepare to, uh, to do well in this exam. So do, are there any questions or suggestions on uh, what to look at? I'm kind of struggling with exercise three of the lab. Exercise three of the lab? Yeah. Which I think would effectively help us go over exam stuff. It's worded kind of like that. Oh, this egg carton, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good one to do. Let's do this one. So <clears throat> we're going to do this um, egg carton problem. So we have a... We have the UML class diagram, and the, the problem is to implement the code, implement this class, and then write the test code for it. Or maybe I'll give the test code. No, I don't. So you want to write the test code for it. We're going to implement this egg carton class and then write test code for it. And it should look similar to you know this test code here. So that's the format I want you to use. So I'm going to start by copying this. Uh, let me do this. So here's um, our main function. And instead of including the number class, the number header, we'll, we'll include the header file for the egg carton class. And uh, you know, we're going to run these tests, and then we're going to print all tests passed. So we're going to do the tests here. And then we print all tests pass. There we go. Well, that won't compile because we did not uh, define that egg carton header. So let's create the egg carton header. And uh, although it's not needed in this problem, it's a good idea to use this pragma once directive so you don't get circular includes. Now we'll get compilation because um, this include is defined, although it has nothing in it, and then we're not doing anything yet. So in the test code, you know, we'll, we're going to make a ticket create an instance of it, the egg carton class. And I'll just call it cart. And uh, let's see, what does it take here? You need to read this description here to know what's going on. This, this explains how the functions work. So this egg carton is a uh, contains two member variables, two integers. One that keeps track of the number of brown eggs in the carton, and the other that keeps track of the number of white eggs. So you can imagine, I mean, this doesn't happen in real life unless, you know, in your refrigerator you're mixing white and brown <laughs> eggs together. So you've got a carton, an old-fashioned carton with 12 positions in it, and you're putting eggs in there, and there's some are white and some are brown. Okay. And so instances of this class, they model 
you know, what might happen in the real world. You know, maybe your refrigerator has three egg cartons in it, you know, and you have brown and white eggs in, in both of those, in all three of those cartons. So you would have three instances of this class, and then you would have, you know, a record in each of those instances of how many brown eggs and white eggs are in each of those cartons. So you would somehow use that in your, in a program, you know, your, you have a cell phone app or something that checks the food you have in your refrigerator. You know, just something. So it would be used, that's how it's used. These classes are used to sort of model, in many cases, they're used to model real world things. And um, in some cases, they're just abstractions that are used to help solve a programming problem. So, uh, so this is the this is the data that's stored. So you have to think about that. That's the data that's in the these object instances. You know, when you create an instance of this data type, the data that's in that instance is these two numbers: how many round eggs, how many white eggs are in the carton. The number twelve that's the capacity of the carton. That's that's just a given. That's fixed. So that's not a variable in this problem. It could be that in a different problem. You know, you've got different size cartons. You've got a carton that has 18 eggs. And some cartons have 12 eggs. And some have 24 eggs. And well, now we've got to keep track of the carton capacity. So that, that's a different problem. Then we might define the egg carton class to have a third member variable, which had to do with capacity. But for this problem, so it's, it's just you, you define these classes for the need of the moment, you know, the thing that you need to solve. And uh, so, just keep that in mind. These things are are flexible, and their the purpose is to solve some specific problem. <clears throat> so now, when you create instances of this egg carton class, you have to um, tell it tell the system how to initialize these two numbers. So when you create a, an instance of this data type, this egg carton data type. You've got to, in that process of creating the instance, you need to say how many brown eggs and how many white eggs are in that carton. And that's done with the constructor. The constructor is shown here in this UML diagram. <clears throat> and you can see the constructor is a function that has no return type. It's called in order to initialize memory that's been set aside to hold the, the object, the instance of the, of the data type. So that once the memory is sort of allocated to hold this um, egg carton instance, then the constructor function runs, and it, and it initializes this data. That's in the memory that's allocated to store that, that object. So the constructor function takes two arguments. The first argument is the number of brown eggs. Second argument is the number of white eggs. Now when we create this egg carton instance, that's what we want those two numbers to equal. And then as the program runs, we're going to use that object. We're going to use that instance, that data type instance. We're going to use that in the program to do something. And for us, we're just writing test code. We're keeping it really simple. We're not, we're not really solving a real problem. We're just practicing with defining and testing these classes. So as the program runs, you've created an instance of this egg carton object, initialized it to hold so many brown eggs, so many white eggs, and then maybe you want to test this add brown eggs function. So you want to, you call this function, because I want to add, you know, 50 brown eggs. Well, that should fail, because 50 is too many. So that's why we return a bool. So we return false to say, oh, I can't do it. I return false. I don't add 50 brown eggs because I can't. This is, uh, there's only 12, a maximum of 12 eggs total in the, in the carton. But if I'm asked to add one brown egg, you know, if n is 1, if we're passing in 1 in our code, and there's one available, at least one available slot in the carton, then the function is going to Increment the number of brown eggs by one, that's this member variable, and it will return true to say to the calling code that the function has succeeded. It's a similar 
with the add white eggs function. And get total eggs is a uh, it just reports to the calling code how many total eggs are in the carton. You know, brown plus white added together. Let's go ahead and um, write some test code now. So the number of um, brown eggs, say, we'll put in uh, four. The uh, number of white eggs, say, we'll put in three. And now let's test the um, get total eggs method. Let's do that. So we're going to assert that on this carton object, when we get when we call get total eggs, that it returns seven. Okay, that's the beginning of our test code. Let's just get this working first before we do the other functions. So we have um, we have a class called egg carton, and that's how it's constructed. Don't forget that semicolon right there. There's a, uh, to simplify it, we have a public section and a private section, although you can organize it differently. And some people are indenting that, and that's good, but you do see in practice, a lot of times, these are not indented in practice, but uh, sometimes they are. So you can do what you like there in terms of indenting public and private. Now let's let's write the constructor. This egg carton constructor function must have the same name exactly as the class name. So I can't call it something else. I have to call it egg carton. And that's true for other languages as well as uh, C++. So Java, for instance, C sharp. This is the case. And uh, so. We're going to take the brown eggs as the first argument and white eggs as the second argument. And then there's a there's a function get total eggs which returns an integer. It looks like that. And then the data that we're wrapping or hiding is the number of brown eggs, which is an integer, and the number of white eggs, which is also an integer. So that's enough to solve, that's enough to get our test code to run. And then we'll add the other two functions after we get that working. So if you look now, we have main.cpp with a test code and eggcarton.h, that's the header file that has the, de the declaration of the class, what it looks like to use our code. And um, now what we need to do is uh, create another file that contains the, uh, the function definitions. Eggcarton.cpp. Let's start by including the egg carton header. So now we're including the declaration of that egg carton class. And uh, we just go through and uh, implement the, the functions that need to be implemented. The first one is the constructor function. The second one is the um, that get total eggs that returns an int. Get total eggs is easy to implement. It's just the um, the brown eggs uh, plus the white eggs. So we compute brown eggs plus white eggs, and then we return it. Now these things are 
member variables. That's data inside the class instance. So you can do this if this makes it easier to sort of remember that that's where those variables are. Those are class instance variables, instance variables, member variables. That's what they call those. Well, we don't. That's optional to use this thing. On the other hand, it's not optional here. We have to use this because the argument name is the same as the member variable name. So there's a naming collision. The function argument name. It's got the same name. And we did that on purpose because it's sort of like good, good documentation. We know where this first argument has got to get copied into. We know it has to get copied into the member variable by the same name. So it's easy to see that. But you could give it a different name. And the same with the white X. There we go. So you now the brown eggs that get passed into the constructor, we we take that value that's passed in the constructor, this brown eggs parameter, and we, we assign it to the brown eggs variable that's in the object. So that's why we use this there to indicate that. We do the same thing for white eggs. Get total eggs. Remember, this is, this is a, there's two different versions of this. This is a simplified version. See, there's, there's, no, um, there's no locally scoped brown eggs or white eggs here. So if we just use the names brown eggs and white eggs directly, the, com the compiler's not confused. There's only one possibility for those names to refer to, and that is the member variables, brown eggs and white eggs. So we can leave that out. So, but some people just use this anyway. They just use that syntax anyway. It's for, it helps them think the problem better. Some languages actually require that you use this. I'm thinking Python and JavaScript. You've got to use that. You have to use that syntax. But in um, <coughs> C Sharp, Java, and uh, C++, it's, that's, um, that's optional. It can be omitted if there's no naming conflict. All right. So this should, this should run. Now, look, look before I run it, look, there's two CPP files here. Those CPP files need to be passed to the compiler. They need to be compiled together. Otherwise, we're going to get a linkage command, uh, a linkage error right now. Looks like it ran. All test paths. There we go. And we just go through and notice I'm writing the test code first. I'm going to go through and uh, test the other functions. So there's seven eggs in there. Let's add um, let's add two brown eggs. Let's add two brown eggs. So we're going to get um, we're going to get a total of um, nine total eggs after that. Also, this function add brown eggs will return true because we can add two. But let's, um, so now there's a total of nine eggs in there. Let's try to add um, four eggs. That would give us, that would give us 13 eggs. That won't fit. 13 eggs doesn't fit. So the function is going to refuse to do the work. And it's going to return false to indicate that, 
that the function didn't succeed. And that means the total eggs will remain at 9. So there's a test code right there. It tests two cases, one where add brown eggs returns true, and it tests the case where add brown eggs returns false. And so I'm testing both branches. You see, the function will have two branches. One is if we can do it, then do something. If we can't do it, then do something else. There's going to be two branches in the function to handle those two cases. So we want the test code to test both of those situations. And that's a property. When you have that, when, you, when your test code covers all possible branches, then that's called your code, your tests are, have what's called good coverage. It covers uh, all of the um, branches that you have in your logic. All right, so let's, um, let's implement that. So add brown eggs. I'm going to pass in n there. Or you know what? Just for now, I'm going to pass in eggs. Oh, did it show me? It's It used an n here, doesn't it? So I'll use n. It doesn't matter. You can use what you want there. It's better to keep the same name as the UML diagram. So add the brown eggs. That returns a bool. So we're implementing a new function. Notice the, the data, the internal data that's being stored in that object instance isn't different. We're just adding more behaviors, more operations available to this um, class. So we're not expanding what the class represents. We're expanding the, um, our abilities to manipulate the class, class instances. Rather. So add brown eggs. Add brown eggs returns a bool. It's in the egg carton class. And it takes an integer n. So we're going to, let's return true. This is called a stub. I just want to see if the test code is set up right, everything. I don't have any compilation errors. This, this is a, called a stub. It's an incomplete implementation of a function. And uh, so that means in the test code, when we call add brown eggs with two, we'll, re we'll always return true, so that'll be true. But we haven't modified the total number of eggs. So this condition here will be false. So the assertion is going to fail there. So the assertion fails on this line 13. I can't remember if it gives you the line number. There it is, this little line. So the assertion should fail at line 13. What is going on? Why do I have that? There it is. Assertion failed on line 13. Right. It, it even shows you the assertion. Carton dot get total eggs equals nine. Assertion failed. All right, so that's good. So we've got that working. We know what we're doing. And I see that. Where did I put that thing? Oh, I'm lost here. There we go. So now what we want to do is uh, we want to add n into the number of brown eggs. So we have brown eggs. Once again, if you want, you can put this in front of it. But for this problem, you don't have to do that. We're going to take uh, whatever's in brown eggs, we're going to add to it n. Does it matter that you have both uppercase and lowercase brown eggs? Yeah, that does matter. This is the case matters here. You mean like in here? Yeah. No, this is the function name. 
The compiler sees this as a whole unit here. It doesn't compare that to this. Those are completely different things. So the function, whenever we use this function, it has to be spelled exactly like this with the case, paying attention to case. It's case sensitive. This is a different name. There's no, no, the compiler doesn't link these two together in any way. This is called lower camel case. Both of these are in lower camel case. There's, see here we've got three uh, words, add, brown, eggs. And the first word starts with a lowercase letter, and the subsequent words start with an uppercase letter. That's called lower camel case. But see the class name, that's called upper camel case, because the words are also identified with uppercase, but the first word is written in uppercase. So that's the, that's the typical convention. There's some variants out there. Like Microsoft, uh, Microsoft uses, tends to use, not uniformly uses, but they, because they have huge, you know, APIs all over the place, but they tend to use, uh, on the newer APIs, they use uh, upper camel case for function names. But well, I would say that this is the standard for this language. Other languages have other set standards. All right. So um, this is a simple solution. This just adds the brown eggs. Now, that means our test here will succeed. We're returning true. We're adding two brown eggs, so the total will now change to nine, so that will succeed. But now when we try to add four brown eggs, we're going to add four, and, uh, and then the function's going to return true. Because we're not checking to see that we're adding too many. We don't do that check yet. So this line 15, line 15 will fail because Add brown eggs always returns true the way we've written it. We only have a partial implementation, but let's test it to this point. So we're doing our development incrementally, and we're testing it each step of the time, trying to keep track of what's going on, making sure that we have a, a correct implementation completed at each step in our in our iterations. So this. Uh, so we're, we're predicting now that the, uh, the test code will fail in line 15. And there it is, line 15. That's good. This thing, the function always returns true. We're not returning false yet. All right, so let's, let's get this to work. Now we have to go back to our, our logic here. See, so we, we really need to do a test. If we, um, if we have enough room, you know, then, then we'll, uh, add the, we'll add the eggs and, and return true. And if we don't have enough room, then we're going to not add anything and return false. All right, so the last thing we got to do here is figure out how to express in code that we have enough room. And there's three numbers that come to mind here. There's, there's 12, that's the capacity of a carton. That's assumed, that's stated in the problem. You know, in real life, cartons have different capacities, but we're, we're just going to model cartons with a capacity of 12 eggs, so that's fixed. So we have the number 12 that comes into play. And we've got so many brown, we have a count of brown eggs and we have a count of white eggs. So we've got three values we have to sort of bring together. And then we have n, which is how many brown eggs to add. So we've got four values, four values that we need to somehow 
to bind together into a ex logical expression that returns true when there's enough room for the n brown eggs and false when there isn't enough room. And this is the part where, you know, most of the students in the past struggle with. Because you can, it's obvious in your mind, it's easy to explain using English or whatever language you, you want to use, but expressing it using uh, the language, the computer language, translating from what you know in your head to writing it in a computer language, that's the, that's the thing that you're learning how to do here in this class. Obviously, you're not learning how to count eggs. <laughs> All right, so let's do that. How are we going to do this? I mean, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. We can even call get total eggs if we want to. Yeah. yeah, but I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to take this out here because we don't need that. It's a little bit extra to look at. Well, let's think about it. The number of eggs that we currently have is brown eggs plus white eggs. And if if, and we're in an if statement here, if we were to add n brown eggs, that would be the resulting number of eggs in the carton, right there, wouldn't it? Now, if we added n, then the total number of eggs in the carton would be that expression, brown eggs plus white eggs plus n. Now, the problem is, if this expression, or well, not the problem, the, 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 what we want is we want this value to be less than or equal to 12. If that expression, if that computation is less than or equal to 12, that means the total resulting eggs is, is good. So let's go ahead and at that point, see this expression does not modify brown eggs. But, so we just use the expression just to calculate what, would, what it would look like if we were to modify brown eggs. Now that we know that we can, then we go in here and actually assign something new to brown eggs. And then we return true to say everything went fine. Now, if this turns out, if n is too big in relation to brown eggs plus white eggs, then we're going to execute the else section. And uh, we'll return false. And we will not modify brown eggs in that case. All right, let's see. That compiles. All tests passed. We did it. We got it. Now we need to do the same thing for white eggs. It's, uh, it's um, identical. No. Same, same code. It's very redundant. So I'm, I'm going to skip that. Do I use the same variable for both? Does that confuse the... No. Because remember, this n here is only visible between this opening brace and that closing brace. So if you have another function called add white eggs, and you've got an n in that as an argument, there's no intersection. It's as if two people with the same name one person is in this room, and the other person with the same name is in the other room. This is not a conflict. We can use that name, Bob. How are you, Bob? You know, the, the person next door isn't going to come over here and say, I'm fine. They, they won't even hear us. So that's out of scope. So this n here is scoped to this function. So it's only visible here. So these, the scoping, you're know, always thinking about scoping, just like here, brown eggs. This is defined for this function here. But there's another brown eggs around, and that's, uh, and that's the brown eggs that's in wider scope, and a uh, larger scope, I guess. I'm not sure the adjective on that. So we, we, we want to to designate that other brown eggs storage location, we have to qualify it with this. So we don't have to concern about adding brown eggs and white eggs simultaneously? Yeah. Um, I think, let me see what you mean by simultaneously. Like, can you 
say we have seven eggs in the carton and you want to add two brown eggs and two white eggs. Well, you can't do it simultaneously okay. anyway, so yeah. you don't have to worry about it. Okay. You want to add the brown eggs first or you want to add the white eggs first? You can only do it sequentially. Okay. Actually, I imagine we could do it simultaneously. Yeah, I mean, if we're using, uh, you know, because these processors actually uh, run in parallel, you know, you've got... Uh, and you could actually do that, uh, but then there would be a, a conflict. But our yeah. program runs in a single thread. Oh. Yeah. I know it's outside of our scope, but what happens if your count exceeds the integer value and loops back around through the negative back into the positive? Then you got a problem. Yeah. Then that's a bug. So then you have to control for that. If you think that your value is going to um, exceed that which is available through your memory allocation. And then you have to you have to watch for that. You have to control for that. But for us, n is so large. I mean, n is you know millions, and so we're not we're not we're just not concerned with it. But if if n had to be super large, because this this n carton was that big, then we would use a, a long integer, not not l long, just long. Now we're using eight bytes instead of four bytes to store n. <coughs> And then it's, and you say, well, is that big enough? And if that's not big enough, because you can think of a scenario where a larger value is going to come in, then you need to use something even bigger than a long. So um, that is something you always have to think about. So int is big enough for this problem, but it's not big enough for all problems. Yeah, once again, these, these are equivalent. Just take that out. It's easier like that. Some For some people, it's easier to put the this in there. Others not. And we're just scratching the surface here. You know, we're not, not overloading you on stuff. This gets a lot more complicated than this. So this is it. I mean, that's all you got to know how to do is what, what we're seeing right here. And you need to know how to come up with this diagram. So I may give you... I may give you... Um, this code here, the header. I may give that to you and say, come up with the UML class diagram, and then you would draw that. Or I'll give you the class diagram and then tell you to come up with, with this, uh, the declaration. And then there's going to be, you know, test code. You're going to need to write test code like this. And when think about it, when you when you're asked to write test code in this exam, and I'm going to ask you to write test code for a class, I'm, I'm going to ask you to write the egg carton class or the number class or the school bus class. And there's some other ones I can't remember, but they're there. And uh, the very first thing you're going to do in your test code is create an instance of your class. And you, you can create multiple instances as well. You know, we, can, we can create another instance down here and uh, use it for some other purpose. I just didn't do that. I'd call it carton 2 now. So classes are meant to be used for making multiple instances. So when you're faced with writing the test codes, now I can't remember. Well, it's easy to remember. You need to create an instance of your class. So you have to call a constructor. And this is, this is the syntax. That has to be memorized. Then after you call this constructor, then you need to start testing and use the assert function with these expressions that evaluate the true or false. And that's it. That's the that's how you do the test code. The test code should be pretty easy, but practice that. Practice this from memory. Writing this line here. This is how you instantiate an instance of egg carton. And you could use a different variable. You could you could call that C. Yeah, if you wanted to call that C, that's that's fine. You could do that. You know, on the test, it's shorter.
Okay. So oh. in our test, yeah. sorry, uh, in our test code, if we, so the only thing we can really test for adding white eggs is two, three or less, because otherwise we'll be over the egg carton to yeah. see if it'll pass. Yeah. We don't have any way of removing eggs with this lab. No, but we could add a function to remove eggs. Yeah, yeah no, I'm, yeah. I'm aware. But not in this problem. Okay. Yeah. Well, the other thing I wanted to mention, which I sort of not not doing, is um, this function is const. This function is not const. This function is const because it's like read only. It just it it only reads the data inside the object. The reports gives a report. But this function potentially modifies the data in the object. So we cannot declare that as const. Now if we set that const there, we need to do it here as well. And that's important. This is actually important. Not, not critically important, but important. Do we have to set a const for what we submit? Uh, you should put const in there. Let's play it safe. <clears throat> Any other um, problems? You know, one thing that um, that this this uh, this class doesn't um, illustrate are getters and setters, which are very simple, but. I think next year I'm going to redo this egg carton problem, and uh, I'm going to simplify it, I think. And uh, I'm going to get rid of brown eggs and white eggs, just have eggs. And then I'm going to have a getter and setter in there. So I'm going to simplify this next year. And I thought about doing it today, and I woke up and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to simplify it. And, present. and I realized that, no, everyone's been working on this already. I'm just going to confuse everybody. So I'm going to leave it this, like this. That's the egg carton class. Then we have the number class. I think we went over that. And um, school bus, it's like egg carton. You know, it's a little different here. Here it's the, um, you get the number of students seated in the bus. Just like the number of eggs in the egg carton. But this is different than the egg carton class because the egg carton class had a fixed capacity of 12. But the school bus class has a variable capacity determined by this first argument to the constructor called seats. Now we're going to have different size school buses. But we're not going to distinguish between the students on the bus. We're not going to have brown eggs and white eggs. We're just going to have students. <laughs> so we have, it's different. You see, it's, you know, this is just a different kind of problem. So you've got to keep track of those differences. There's a function to add students, remove students, and here we go. Now we're removing students. And then uh, a function to get students. And this is the, you know, called a getter method here. Or it should be maybe get seated students. And uh, so we can, uh, this is a good class to look at. This is the, the constructor is, is, all the constructors look pretty much the same. A constructor should be the easiest function to implement in the exam. If you don't think this is the easiest function, then think more about this. This is whatever's getting passed in is simply assigned to the member variables like that with this in front of the member variable name. So that all the constructors I'm going to ask in this class will look like that. And that's, that's a typical constructor, 99% of the time. In practice, that's what a constructor does. But there are cases when constructors do more than that. But we're not looking at those cases. Get students function. How do you implement the get students function? See, look, there's two member variables. This is the number of seats in the bus. This is the number of seated students. 
I think if I did this again, I would just call that students instead of seated students. So the, the getter method is get students. That, that, that's more common in practice. Anyway, we just need to return a number of seated students. So provide an implementation of get students. We just return seated students. I have a question. Yeah. So for the answer for this, we just have get students in the cons thing. But in our implementation, we have the, like if the egg carton. Was oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's eggs. right. I forgot to put that in there, actually. Yeah, you would need to prefix this with the um, class name. School bus. Class yeah, I actually forgot to put that in there. Call call. On the exam, on the other hand, that's all. If you put that, then you get full credit right there on the exam. You don't have to give me this in the exam. Okay. And I want the implementation, and I, I probably should have just shown it like that. And that, that's a mistake. Actually, I should have put school bus colon colon. But on the exam, what I have highlighted is good enough. So would the same thing be the case for the add school student. bus part as well? Yeah, Just same. If I students. ask you, huh? Like, would the same oh, the constructor? Yeah. Like yeah, here, this is OK on the exam, if you give that to me on the exam. Okay. I just want that part. And you can check with me while you're taking the exam if you're not sure about that. All right. So this is the add students. It's similar to um, the egg carton class. We return true or false whether we could add the students or not. Because we do have the capacity. So if the seated students plus the number of students to add, if that exceeds the number of seats, then we return false and don't do anything. Otherwise, we, we go ahead and add the students in there. Would we need the this? No, we don't, yeah. actually. Okay. This, my code is a little sloppy. Yeah, I used this here. I should have used this here as well, but I didn't. I, I, I did that. This could clean this up a little bit. Sorry about that. So this is optional. And once again, your answer only needs that on the exam. And this is... Um, this is optional. And you could put it here if you wanted to as well. See, I should have been consistent. Because I used it here, I should have used it here as well. And here as well. Those are the member variables. But see, these variables don't conflict with the function argument. So you can omit this. So I need to go back and fix this web page. Let me get rid of that. Remove students. It's similar. You have to check a condition. If the condition fails, then you return uh, false. If the, this is the students to remove. So you want to remove students. That's the students to remove, just the variable students. So if the students to remove is greater than the number of seated students, you can't remove that many students. You don't have that any. You don't have that many students to remove. So it's a logic error. We're going to return false to report this mistake in logic. Otherwise, the data is good and will decrease the number of seated students by that value that's passed into the function students. And we're, then we return true to say everything succeeded. Everything went well. And here's test code. Look at the test code. You know, I told you about this pattern. The first thing we do was we create an instance of school bus and pass in the right number of arguments. So the capacity, the number of seats in the bus is the first argument. So there's 10 seats in this bus. The second argument is the number of students that are seated in the bus. So there's five. So it's filled to half of its capacity. And then we'll check the, um, you know, we call it get students, should return five. Remember, get students just returns the number of seated students. And then we try to add four students, which is okay because we only have five in there. If we add four, we'll get nine. That's under 10. 
So that function returns true, and then when we call get students, now it doesn't return five anymore. Now it returns nine. Now if we try to add three students, that would give us 12 students, but we can only hold 10, because that was our capacity, see 10 here. So the function will return false. And it won't do anything about the students that are seated. So this get students will continue to return nine there. Now we're not we're not testing everything here. We're not testing remove students, are we? Because the problem asks for test code for add students function. I just want a test code for that function. I didn't want test code for the other functions. But we did, we ended up using the constructor, but we have to use the other functions anyway. We use the constructor and we use this function get students. Just as we just need that to make good test code. But the objective of the test code is to add, is to test the add students function. That was the purpose of this problem. So you'll notice we don't we don't need to use remove students. That's it's not necessary in this test code. And notice I don't have main, you know, I didn't declare include schoolbus.h. I don't have that stuff. I'm just showing you the, you know, and you only need to report these lines, the function uh, contents, the function body. I'm not going to go into this. These are alternative implementations of add students or remove students. Uh, let's take a look at this. So do we have to worry about those types of questions on the exam then? You know, I'm not going to give that to you. See this down here? Provide an alternative implementation. I'm not going to do that. Okay. It's overload. I used to ask that. In fact, I'm going to chop this from my web page. I'm just going to chop that. But number nine would be something that would still, because it's just a test code. Well, it's a test code for seven, right? Oh yeah, I'll drop that as well. Well, yeah, I mean it's it's just test code for the alternative implementations. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll probably draw, I'll delete these uh, oh, okay. next quarter when I teach a class. Same thing for the for the practice exam. Yeah. The, should we not do like the ones that are asking that as well? It's like seven and eight on the. Yeah, that's right down there. The alternate. Yeah, I'm not going to ask alternative implementation. I'm not going to ask that. So historically, how do your students usually do on the second test? Huh? Historically, how well do your students yeah, usually do I get do on variation second? quarter to quarter, you know, but it, this is not a hard test, actually. You just have to struggle with it a little bit. We're not covering a lot. Now, you might think it's a lot, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Historically, uh, the students that study uh, are going to ace this test. You just have to prepare for it, that's all. Now the next test is different. In the next <laughs> test, you've got to have some creative abilities. You have to be a creative problem solver. And because uh, you have to do more programming, like work with loops and things like that. But this test is, um, you don't really need a lot of Sort of creative problem solving skills. You just have to. This the purpose of this is get accustomed to classes, and uh, which is a very important thing in all programming languages, almost all, ninety nine percent, these days. So it's just giving you a little taste for it. So here, bean jar. This I ask this a lot. I I ask the bean jar questions about the bean jar class a lot. This is like the school bus problem. There's a max beans and beans. It's different than the egg cart. Egg cart, you've got a fixed capacity of 12. And this one is like the school bus class in that I have a variable capacity. Max beans is the capacity of your bean jar. How many beans you can hold. And beans is how many beans are in there currently. Then you see you can add beans and you can remove beans. This I, I have asked this one a lot in the past. You know this this problem I've used this problem. I'm not saying I'm going to use it this time, but a good 
variation that I was thinking of this morning is to keep the school bus class, or not school bus, sorry, the, the egg carton class. And um, what I could do is um, get rid of um, get rid of the different colors. We just have eggs. This is a simplification. Let me show you what that would look like. So now we just have get eggs and we have add eggs. And then we just have eggs. This is what I was going to present today. I'm just well, I'm presenting it now. That's right. I gotta get rid of this. And uh, so this is a possible uh, problem on the on the test. This is uh, a lot simpler. And then maybe remove eggs. And this is get eggs. So in this case, it would still be bounded by the size of the carton. The carton doesn't change. Either. Yeah, this is the carton is of size 12, 12 exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's simpler than the, the other, than the school bus uh, problem. See how that's working out right there? And this is add eggs. That should do it right there. Oh, line 10, get eggs is not seven. Oh, let's fix that. The problem is the test code is not our implementation. So let's start with seven, seven eggs. Now we got it. So there we go. The simplification. So maybe I put this on the, on the test. Maybe. And just to verify, the test is only going to cover lot five material? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know what I have done in the past? Um, I did cover um, uh, some of the other material. So you better stay, stay current on that as well. I think it was the number class, like is prime. I could ask you this number class thing, or something like it. So is prime, the algorithm to determine whether a number is prime or not. All right. You should all know this. <laughs> How do you determine if a number n is prime? We have a loop. Yeah. Try all the numbers from 2 to n minus 1. You take n and divide by i, right? Do mod, n mod i. If we get a 0 for any of those numbers, it's not prime. If you finish the loop and you don't get a 0 when you do the n mod i, then you know it's prime. So that, that algorithm, you should know that. And you should be able to write that in this class. So that's a part of this problem here. So this is also uh, a possible problem on the exam. Is divisible by? That's that's pretty easy, right? This function here. Everybody agree that that's well. Not everybody agrees. Who doesn't know that is divisible by is an easy problem, easy function to implement. So then. The class, look at this. Where is that class? The class, this number class, has a uh, has a value in it that it's storing. And this function is divisible by takes takes a, an argument. It's like is the number that the number instance represents is that number divisible by three? So how do you do that? Well, you do n mod 3, right? Or let's suppose the value that's being passed in is k, and the member variable is n. So it's n mod k. So if n mod k is 0, we know that n is divisible by k. 
So then we return true. Yes, it's divisible by 3. Amen. So this, this is a one-liner. Return n mod k equals 0. That's the implementation for that one. So I think we did that in lab. Or most people did that in lab. Why don't we have, we're at near the end here. Do you want to see this written out more, or are you OK? I can see it written out more. Huh? Do you, do you, do you uh, write it out more? Yes, you please. More? You want to see it? Yes. Oh, OK. Well, really quickly. So we got like five minutes. Let's, uh, let's do it in five minutes. <laughs> So a number class. Looks like this, the public section. We've got a constructor that takes uh, an integer n. And you get these functions, uh, is divisible, divisible. By, and then it takes an integer k. I'm going to skip the other function for now. And then we have a, an integer n, that's the member variable. So instances of the number class just represent some number, and the number is stored in n. So, that's it. Okay. so then we have the constructor, and uh, that's going to be straightforward, this arrow n is n, and then the um, is divisible by, that's returns a bool. Okay. Constructor doesn't return anything. And we're just going to return n mod k equals 0. That might be hard for you to look at, so Maybe this helps if you do this. If n mod k equals 0, return the result. That thing in parentheses is true or false. You know, is n divided, divisible by k? That's the statement. n is divisible by k. n is divisible by k. That's this statement. That statement is true or it is false. n mod k is 0 when n is divisible by k. And... Uh, Then we have um, like is prime. By the way, these should be um, const. Notice is prime does not take an argument. Is divisible by takes an argument. Oops, this should be bool. I made a mistake there. And is prime is this you should have this down. Alright? Is n prime or not? For integer i is two. I is strictly less than n plus plus i. So i is the number that we're going to try to divide into n. We want to find a number that divides into n so we can declare that n is not prime. So if n mod i is not 0, then it's not prime. If we finish the loop and we, and we didn't find an i that divided into n, then we know it's, it's, uh, it's prime. I said that should be equals. Yeah. Sorry. No, you're all good. Sorry, sorry. Thank you for catching that. There we go. So if we find an i that divides into n, return false. It's not prime. And uh, what was I going to say there about that? Oh, this n, remember, 
this is different. This i, look at the i. There's two variables, i and n. You know, when I see those, I see two different kinds of things. I exists only within this context. It doesn't even, it's not even visible in the whole function. It's only visible inside the for loop. That's its scope. But this n, this n is visible in the entire function, and it's visible in the other functions, because that n is the member variable n. So if that's confusing to you and you want to make a, a note, you could always do this. You know, put a this in front of that. Maybe that makes it even more confusing. <laughs> this, that this operator or this symbol is going to be very important in the future. Uh, and for those who are going on to take 202, this uh, you know you have to learn about pointers. But this is fine like that. All right, that's it.